Then, I mean, if that's what you want to do, man, flip it back around. It's <laughs> advertising. It's the name of the game. All, All right, right. we are ready. We are going live. What's up, boys? What are we going to talk about today? Uh, Shiv, I guess we'll just talk about some more ransomware because what's a week of a podcast without some ransomware? And um, we'll probably sprinkle in a little bit of cybersecurity stuff around the whole thing. What do you, what do you say? That works for me. How about you, Brian? Brian, for those of you listening, Brian Weiss is from iTech Solutions out of uh, California. I'll leave the city to him because I will probably butcher it. So go for it, Brian. San Luis Obispo, California. Yeah. yeah bless you. So, thanks for having me on this podcast again. Yeah, it's always fun. Anything uh, you wanted to? Uh... So I must not have done something too bad on the last one. <laughs> no, we just want to bring you back for more punishment. All right. I sure. think you came out pretty pretty unscathed. You know. I'm I'm a glutton for punishment. It helps me develop my thick skin. We we've grown. We don't uh, go after people unless you're Kaseya. If you're Kaseya, <laughs> we will go after you. But yeah. anyone else, it's all good. So you want to kick it off, Eric? With uh, last week, all of the major ransomware players were putting their onion sites into the darkness. Well, not all of them, but there's definitely a, a moving trend, right? So we're seeing, you know, dark side is supposedly shut down. Um, you know, again, just for clarification, you know, no government is friggin' taking over it. Uh, you know, that's those guys were still in operation, collecting their money, doing their thing. Um, but their name and shame site is definitely down. Their payment portal is still up. Um, but yeah, uh, now Avidon is saying that they have shut down. I can't confirm that the, you know, we were talking about it last week. I was like, man, what's going on? All these onion sites are disappearing. Um, and then like 48 hours later, this thing starts showing up where they are releasing their decryption keys, which, you know, is about par for the course for any time you, uh, um, you know, the, any of these folks start shutting down. Um, the Can we talk about that a little bit? Because... You know, I, I, I've been thinking about this and understanding, trying to put myself in their shoes and understanding why would you do this? And my first thought, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this, is, you know, they're essentially running a business, right? And, and we all run businesses, right? So we have clients. And so you figure, you know, technically these are clients that have this Avidon ransomware. And it's almost like, uh, it's not worth servicing these clients anymore because there's not enough money in it. And we've got a bigger fish that if we spend more time on that, we can make more money. So it's almost like redirecting, right? You've got limited resources. You don't want to spend time with that ransom anywhere anymore because maybe it's not making as much money as some other opportunities. So you're shifting your focus. Is that kind of the idea? I don't think so. Uh no. To put this, to put Avidon into perspective, that article you had up there, Eric, my notes say they had they released two thousand nine hundred and thirty four decryption keys. Mm -hmm. So they had a lot more persistence and customers than even I have. I mean, if you, they're not a small operation, so, what so I why would they leave money on the table? I guess is the question. I think it's two reasons. The U.S. has created this narrative about going after ransomware operators. And I haven't checked, but I'm willing to bet Avidon is probably on the OFAC list. And it's very easy for these guys to shed their skins like a snake would, put on a new one, and go to town. So this is really based on their ability to live to fight another day. And with the FBI getting the part of the, the ransomware back from the Colonial Pipeline, I'm willing to bet this is one of these lulls that the ransomware groups go into to adapt their techniques and tactics. So they're, I, I see, yeah. So the risk has gone up for them and they're covering their tracks to come back and fight another day essentially, right? I think so. They're going to nuke and pave it all and just come back. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, think of this as a... You know, a kid's roller coaster, if you will. You know, you got the peaks and you got the valleys, you got the peaks and you got the valleys, right? 
Um, every once in a while, you do a little shimmy and a shake and stuff like that. But you know, they're. I think they're starting to go into a lot of the old school mentality. You know, when I say old school, I'm talking about three, four years ago, where the ransomware groups will operate for six to twelve months and then disband, regroup, and come out as a different name. And I think that's what's going on. You know, you know, I, I know a lot of people are going to want to say, "Oh, well, you know, our government is awesome, and they are, you know, just doing so much great stuff, and they're making these people shut down and run and hide." And you know. It's just bullshit, to be honest with you, in my opinion. This is purely, you know, them, you know. So let's just say, you know, this week I go by my legal name of Eric Taylor, and I go commit 13 robberies, you know. But then I'm like, okay, I the heat is on me. I need to, you know, do something different. So I stop using the name Eric Taylor, and I start using Billy Bo Bob. Um, I wait two weeks. I, you know, learn a new trick of how to break into your house, and I still start doing it that way. But now I'm going as Billy Bob, and it's kind of the same mentality. They're, they're not going anywhere. You know, me and Shiva joke that they're all in one building. They're just moving from cubicle to cubicle to cubicle. That may be what's going on. You know, they're just retooling, retraining things of that nature. But, you know, when I'm looking at the dark net feed, and you know, I hate that term, dark net, but when, when you're on the dark It's okay. Net, you can use ID agent, and they would have prevented any password-related breaches. Oh, don't fucking get me started on that piece of shit. Um, the – we're not going to troll that too much today, I don't think. But maybe. The, the ship has always got the triggering mechanism with anything can say it. The um, – actually made me lose my train of thought. Great job, man. <laughs> you know, one thing is I would say that the ransomware operators seem to be very dynamic – and they can turn a semi on a dime. And I think this is what it is, but the big bad wolf of ransomware, Re-Evil, has been very active in the last week. And they yep. have now said they will specifically target U.S. companies, U.S. government entities, and they don't care. So we've got Re-Evil, and we got the, and I'll butcher this freaking name, Promethis or whatever, which Prometheus. is the group... Prometheus, which is the group of Re-Evil. And I posted it out there earlier, and I kind of poked back Matt Lee on it on Twitter to see if uh, – or uh, LinkedIn to see if he wanted to play games because, you know, he's um, doing the whole try hack me websites and stuff like that. I'm like, you, you want, if you want a real challenge, let's go play. But he never did take me up on it there. In his defense, I don't think I would want to poke Prometheus or Re-Evil either. I like my life. Dude, I – I want to poke that WordPress site so bad. Oh. <laughs> hey, didn't you send me something that one of the ransomware strains are now on GitHub? Yeah, so re there I don't know. This looks like a and I'll have to pull up the link here for the video side of things, but there was a version 1 of Reevil that was publicized on GitHub. Um which er, for those who do know or do not know, you know, Reevil's in version two right now. Um, yeah, it's it's crazy that, that actually got put out. So the you can actually build your own ransomware package, deploy it, and encrypt a system. And I give Reevil probably a backdoor into your system. Probably. You know, that actually brings me up to another point you know, as a side comment. You know, I'm just going to put this thing out there just because we had a ransomware case not too long ago or going through this last week. If you are an IT firm, and I'm just going to look directly at this camera. If you're an IT firm using P PMS Pico or KMS Pico on your clients for 80 some odd workstations, you should burn in hell. Because you know, you're not only pirating, but those things are known to give back doors and you're just inviting the hackers in. I mean, you might as well just leave RDP open to every freaking port and put a fucking neon sign above your head say please come hack me that kind of goes for most rmms i mean that's why i left connectwise right i landed at Datto because there was a lot of transparency and a lot better people dealing with any issues that pop up there uh mm -hmm. but going back to revil did you guys see they hit a nuclear weapons contractor yeah and i was looking on both re-evil and the, the new one, and I don't see where either one of them are showing claim for that right now. 
which is weird. Because uh, the articles were showing where there was communication going on about it, but I never saw it. Well, that goes back to something we discussed before. A lot of companies are doing the attribution for the government, and the government's not actually coming out and giving the attribution. You're in the uh, municipal space, Brian. Are you seeing any upticks in ransomware? Uh, well, we got our latest municipal municipality client, I guess is how you would say it, a city, because their old um, MSP got hit with ransomware. Um, and, you know, through their RMM, um, all, their, all their clients, no, this was, uh, connect wise, same shit. <laughs> and, uh, and we actually found evidence that it came from that old MSP. And I was kind of surprised that the MSP wouldn't really own up to it. They acted like, you know, it wasn't, they weren't the source, even though we found evidence and then it never really can't, not not that I heard lately any litigation like the city never even went after the MSP. You know, they just used their own insurance policy and we helped, you know, clean it up and then built the trust and now have them as a client. And we're in the M365 hardening process with them. But uh, I would say at, at the very least, you know, they're getting targeted, you know, with with phishing emails for obvious reasons. So that's why we're focusing on the M365 hardening as kind of a a first step. They already do have a data backup device that technically was the first step. Uh, when we got in there, we're like, hey, we're not going to take anything over until we replace this antiquated backup that you weren't able to restore from during this ransomware event. <laughs> was it a data backup before you got in? No, no, it was, a, it was a Western digital NAS that they oh, were, bullshit. that <laughs> I swear to God, that they were using Windows backup to image to. Fantastic. Now I got a question for you. I got three questions for you. Number one, mandatory MFA on uh, 365. Mm -hmm. Did you stop the users from authorizing applications into 365? That's part of our baseline that we use. Yeah. Fantastic. And number three, because we had him on a couple episodes ago, and I think he's pretty damn smart. Did you drop black point in there? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So okay. for sure. I mean, you got to have a 24 seven sock, keeping an eye on things. Um, you have to have a capable 24 seven sock. And I, think, and, I, and I really think that's black point and their team. Uh, John's got yeah. some interesting takes that taught me a lot in our uh, conversation. Yeah. And, and I'd like to give a plug too to who's really helping us with our M365 hardening which is Simeon Cloud. They've got a, about 95 baseline policies that we can consistently deploy across our clients, avoiding all the manual, um, you know, script deploying or God forbid GUI, you know, actions. And, um, it, and it also makes it easy too, if we want to apply a new baseline policy across all our clients, we, we add it in one place and we say deploy out to clients, right? Assuming it's not going to break them. You know, otherwise you have to do one well, by one. Here's a question for you, because what I've learned is multiple tenants can be on different versions. And I'm sorry, multiple tenants of Microsoft 365 can be on multiple versions. So when you do a push out of Simeon Cloud or whatever they call it, does it break things for certain tenants because it may not be on the same version that that script was created for? Or not script, but that package? Uh, you know from what I know of their baseline policies they have now, I don't know of any that would care about a versioning. Um, it pushes them out via PowerShell, right? So they're just automating that process for you essentially is, you know, one of the benefits, but that's a good point to bring up. I'll have to get back to them and, and confirm whether or not that's a concern. Cause the reason is I've, I've, I've looked at them. I've looked at Nuvalex. I've looked at Skykick, uh, core view or something like, and a couple others. And while they're all, they all, each have very good pros, none of them get you all the way there in terms of this multi-tenancy management, I think at least. And But I stopped looking into them, all these things six months ago. But I'd want to make sure because they are pushing PowerShell that yeah. it's going to work across all the versions of 365 that are out there. And I don't even think Microsoft can track how many versions they have out there because I've got newer tenants that we've created in the last year that are older 
older than my tenant, which was created a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I'll have to talk to them about that. I imagine there's a way they can detect the tenant version, I would hope, right? I have no idea. I don't, I mean, it's got, if it's, it depends if it's really exposed to the graph API. Uh, yeah, yeah. When I looked at Simeon, they, I think they were calling them golden images and they were just like old school Norton Ghost pushing it out there and saying, hey, this is what you're going to be, which if mm -hmm. it works, fantastic. You brought up an interesting topic though, and this is something we talked about the last time, Eric, you and I, putting in backup that actually works as the first step. Why, why is that your first step and not just going to secure them instantaneously? Basically, because when shit hits the fan, that's the only thing that's going to help us come out looking like the superheroes, you know? Um, I, I would say even before all of the, these ransomware concerns, if I, you know, went into a client, typically they've got an old ass server that needs to be replaced. And the last thing you want to do is take on that liability without knowing you have a solid backup. And I would say ever since we moved to using the data Cirrus line, my team sleeps a ton better. Now, are you using their virtual Cirrus or are you using the hardware? We're using their hardware, yeah. Why not the virtual? Um, we have one client we're entertaining the virtual with right now that's actually, you know, they've, they've got a VMware and a data center. Um, part of the, the, the issue with the virtual is, is when it comes to the local failover. You know, you're kind of doing a virtual inside of a virtual. <laughs> exactly, and that's what I tried to tell them. Yeah. You know, that, that Cirrus box, the physical box, is a very modular snap-in. You take it out of the packaging, slap it into a rack, plug it in, put the agent, whatever the deployment is, and you're rock, you're ready to rock and roll within an hour. I don't care if you have 10 servers, 100 servers. You're ready to go. Now, this virtual Cirrus, I'm going to virtualize in a, virtu in a virtual, I mean, you're get, and the weak part is still going to be that client's hardware. It's an yeah. easier conversation to say, hey, let's get this box, put it in, and it's going to do X, Y, Z for you as opposed to, hey, that aging server that you bought with too few resources three years ago because the MSP wanted to make, the previous MSP wanted to make the sale, it's probably not going to pass muster. Yeah. The one thing I definitely want to touch on, and I have a great uh, annoying fear that this is going to happen is as we are starting to have the conversation with folks about implementing the backup first, then they will hold off on the security measures because, hey, you've got this really kick-ass backup solution. Why do we need all this security? You're able to recover us, right? What the hell? Well, I think that the conversation there, and you guys correct me if you disagree, is the backup is there to get you back up and running. The security is there to tr give you your best shot at not having all of your data exposed to the world. Mm -hmm. And it's as simple as that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're going to see, you know, I'm on the fence when it comes to government regulation. I, I like the fact that um, it helps, you know, hold people accountable. I hate the fact it's the government. <laughs> but you know, you're, you're telling me about, and I'm talking about the civilian side here because the military side, I don't think we know what the hell's going on over there. And I hope they're doing something that's good. But look at SolarWinds. Look at Pulse Secure. Mm -hmm. Up until a month or two months ago, which would have been two months after Pulse Secure, they were still being exploited by nation states inside of government agencies. You have all these municipalities that are towing the Sieges line. Yes, we are compliant, but they're not. And half the guys out there doing Sieges work aren't going to rock the boat because they keep wanting they keep want to be select be selected to do that siege's work. Yep. Yeah, it's all about their bottom line of being able to be able to get that consulting revenue whether they actually fully obtain the self assertion of siege's or anything else. It's definitely um it's definitely a hit, you know, we talked about it before show that when these folks are supposedly uh, migrating away from NIST 800-171 over to CMMC level three, they're coming back and saying, well, we need all this money. We need all this money to get this thing achieved. Um, and they're like, why? 
you said you were there. You're just adding 30 extra controls. Why do you need $1.3 million? And 1.3 is a fictional number. I'm just throwing out there, but they're asking for gobs and gobs of freaking money. You know, and it's, you know, like we said before, Shiva, you know, just to bring Brian into the loop of the conversations, um, because nobody actually watches the, these videos at all. But um, the, there, it's all self acetation. You know, it's just saying we are this, therefore we are, or we must be. It's, it's. I think it's check. It's that checkbox mentality, right? And we discussed this the last time. It's hey, let's get FireEye in there because it's going to check these boxes for compliance. You go back in, in a couple of years. There's nothing there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's out of the box configuration. Uh, Brian, how many times have you taken over clients and you see a basic installation of a product that has not been configured? Yeah, the the, the city we took over had a Sophos in there, and I, and I go in. I'm like, great, let's grab all the logs off of it. They weren't what logs. Yeah, they weren't piping anything to sim. They didn't even extend the default settings to try to keep long, a larger, you know, a longer amount of logs. Were it they was, auditing? No, it was it was it was like very base, you know, setup. So, and they didn't even really have the right model for. What I have they a did. question here for you, municipality. Did they have to follow CJIS guidelines? This one does. Yes, they have did a police they? department. Did they? No, and we're actually they're t in in you know technically they're still not CJIS compliant, right? I mean, but they're working towards it. We're working you, towards it, right? yeah. Yeah. Which is a big difference from, hey guys, here's our paper, we're we're sieges compliant. Yeah. Until now, were they claiming to be sieges compliant, or they just flat out knew, no, we yeah. are not because whatever. They had to, otherwise they would have gotten cut off from NCIC. Would they really though? No. Exactly. They would. Oh, Brian, were, were they order. were they under the impression that they were sieges so, compliant? Um. No, I'll tell you right now, they knew they needed major security upgrades when they came to us, which is why they got approval to spend more money to work with us. Uh, but what's interesting, too, is the other the other side of it is were they even being asked the right questions? Because when we first took them on, they gave us uh, a questionnaire that they got from the, the I guess, the, the county they're in one step up. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, and I looked at that questionnaire and I was like. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm answering some no to these, some of these questions, right? Because you don't have it in place, but they're also missing like 20 other questions they should be asking you, you know? So take this report with, as a grain of, with a grain of salt to think that you might be secure just because we answered yes to everything eventually, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of it too, is the sense that, um, you know, it's a smaller city, right? It's not a huge city. Right. And so when you get in these smaller municipality districts, are they even do they even have the pressure on them to, to care? You know, and, and that's what I'm hoping they get more pressure with as we see CMC come to light. Um, and, you know, we're not dealing with all these different types of. Uh, Sorry, God. Uh, go ahead. I was going to say we're not dealing with like Sieges or NIST or, you know, it's not all these depending on what you are. With CMMC, it's going to be, you know, hopefully more consistent as far as because of the organization you are, you need to be at this CMMC level, right? But that's going to be for you because you care about your business, you care about your clients, and you want to raise the standard yeah. of you and your business. CMMC is not going to apply to the civilian side, as far as I can tell. Right now, it's only going to be DOD and their subcontractors. Or yeah. the primes shoving it down the subcontractor's throats. Oh, but wouldn't what? the executive order solve all that for us? You know what? Show me when MFA is completely deployed. In four more months? Five more months? <laughs> let's let's see let's see that get done first before you want to talk to me about new standards and new ass scratching. Well, and there's another thing. Uh, you know, another thing about compliance and being held accountable that, you know, I'm coming to realize too, especially with solar winds, e even if you don't have the proper uh, security in place, um, but you've got a, you've got a plan created that says you'll eventually get there. And the reason you're not there now is because it's, you can't financially afford it. 
And as long as you report an incident the minute it happens and follow all the reporting guidelines, you're technically compliant, right? Even though you're not meeting minimum standards in the government's eyes, oh, well, they did everything right and they had a plan. They just couldn't implement it yet. So we're going to let them off the hook. And this is why compliance and security are mutually exclusive. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And this really brings up a question, you know, I'm, we're having with a lot of folks is the fact that um, is, is CGIS, is TMMC, you know, whatever it is, is it going to just be a dog and pony show where, you know, some people will do it, some people won't, but. You know, me and Shiva, you know, had a conversation with uh, some vendors before that was supposed to help us or potentially help us with some documentation. And Shiva will tell you, it's like, oh, well, if you accept the risk, then you're compliant. So literally. And Shiva was like, okay, so I can just say I accept all these risks, all 128 controls that you have, and I'm compliant. Yay. And as Brian said, have a plan to deal with them. Right, because that's what it is. Now, Brian, what are you doing in terms of vulnerability scanning right now? Oh my God, I don't know how many different tools I've been trying out. Um, Not rapid fire tools. It's shit. No, I. Uh, no, it's really good. You should a hundred percent not use it. <laughs> that was actually what we started with, and. Uh, two or three years ago. I think and it's a ra rapid fire tools is almost like a rite of passage. When you decide you want to be an MSP, you get yeah. PSA, you get RMM and you go get rapid fire tools. So you can put out a 2000 page binder in front of a client and say, this is what's wrong with your systems. Pay me $35 an hour. And yeah. we're going to secure it with web root. Yep. So I, I went from, you know, rapid fire to I'm going to get the best of breed went to Qualys. Uh, and what I found with Qualys is it's uh, definitely made for the enterprise. And, you know, for my 25 devices on my network, I'd get about a 3000 page report once a week that they expected me to go through and, you know, then deal with. And so that became, I didn't have the resources in house to use an enterprise tool like that and actually, you know, perform due diligence in, in, you know, correcting everything. So I'm really, you know, I, in vulnerability management is hard to do right. Like, yeah, you can always patch the things that are, you know, high risk, but to get everything, it's very labor intensive. I have a know? question for you there. How many people do you know, think just installing a patch gets rid of the vulnerability when many providers, they miss out on the, Registry keys. Oh. Yeah. In case. Huh. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that are, you know, they go through and put a basic um, package together, if you will, where it's going to, um, you know, supposedly put in, you know, security, but they're not doing the registry keys to uh, do proper enforcement. You know, there was, um, correct me where, I was uh, where I may be mistaken on this one, Shiva, but there was a, a patch not too long ago that and, and you could apply the KB patch from Microsoft and which one is escaping me, but I know. Uh, NetLogon, you know, Spectre, and a couple of the other major ones. But there was also registry keys that you had to set that didn't matter if you had the KB installed or not, the KB was not going to install it yeah. and it wasn't enforced unless that those registry keys are that was set. net log on released in August of last year. And I want to say February 8th or 9th or March 8th or 9th of this year is when Microsoft was going to enforce it. But last year in our own working group, we just figured out the registry keys, created a PowerShell script from the ground up as everyone does these days and bashed it out with RMM. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm actually shopping for a new vulnerability management company. Um, the, the two that I've heard of um, that I'm looking into is Cyber CNS and Kenna Security. Um, you haven't heard about Barricade yet? <laughs> <laughs> they they do they do vulnerability scannings. Uh, we had a call Eric and I with uh, Cyber CNS this morning. Uh, mm -hmm. And the call was really about figuring out their data model. 
And according to them, they are not able to access any data you put into their product, which is refreshing for an MSP centric company these days. But it brings me back. I think uh, John over at Blackpoint mentioned they were going to be doing some interesting vulnerability scanning additions to their platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think John was saying, we'll have to go back and look at it. Um, but there was uh, mentioning where they were originally doing Shodan. That's what they're doing right now. But they're yep. building something My else that's more comprehensive. Mm -hmm. And I kind of put words in his mouth saying, hey, why don't you just go to Tenable and bring them in? He's like, well, we are friendly with them and they are across the street. So, hey. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. It's episode 12, I think it was. I don't know. I'll put the link or in 13th, the Or 13th, whatever. So it, I, I, if you're steeped into the whole Black Point Cyber ecosystem, that might be worth a conversation with you and them. But I did like what I heard out of Cyber CNS. Only thing is, they're you know internationally based. Um, no offices here in the U.S., even though there is a administrative office in Canada, or Canada, as I call it. I'd rather have a company here where there's some degree of recourse, even though I there's do, zero transference of risk. Even though they do have that, I do think, from a vulnerability standpoint, you know, those of us that are going down CMMC and want to start doing a DoD stuff, that will give us at least a as close as possible to a fed ramp model by being a standalone instance in our own tenant that we're able to monitor well let me ask you a question here you know we've been chased i think the three of us have been chasing some degree of cmmc for the last year probably mm -hmm. who's actually made any progress with it and is it really going to make a difference being able to check that box or should we really just say our clients deal with these five or six compliances? Let's build our own, so to speak, but build it from a security standpoint and then map to those controls. That's a fair question for me personally. I'm baselining all my clients at 800, 171, and then going from up there, up from there based on their needs. And I see CMMC is kind of a buzzword. You know, it's kind of like, hey, you know, if, if you're first, uh, you know, to the to the gate, you know, you're likely to take advantage of that buzzword. <laughs> you know. Do you yeah, know? So, do you think it's just not going to have? Sorry, so do you think this thing is not going to have really any teeth like HIPAA or anything else? I'm definitely questioning. Um, you know, how much accountability there is going to be for actually proving and getting audited, you know, um, it, are they going to accept self audits, right? Or are they actually going to require that an outside auditor comes in? I do think they're going to require, that's why they have the C3POs. So Yay, Star Trek. The wars, uh, the, you have to self attest, I believe, to get the third party audit to come in. And yeah. something I raised with Eric last time is why is the DOD outsourcing this to independent third parties? Why don't they do it themselves for the DOD by the DOD? Yeah. Well, you're going to get the good old boy network, right? I mean, just like you see in every industry, you know, the FDA, you know. No, and, come on. That, dude, like, that, 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 that's fake news. You know, Everything a, is 100% legit above yeah. board. There's no impropriety anywhere. Well, you know, it's going to be big <laughs> contracts on the line. Hey, I know this auditor. We're good friends. You know, he'll make sure we get this contract. Oh, we're missing a couple things, but we're going to make s some notes to be able to pass that even though we don't have it, you know. And that's See, that problem, brings up right? the point. That brings up the point that I brought I brought up to you, Shiva. How many of these assessments are going to go through and be like, well, I'm just going to pass you a little bit of money right here. You're just going to say I'm compliant. And Every we're gonna single one. Not All right, some. I give up to a CMM. What's that? I, I give up to a CMMC now. Well, I think you really just got to look to secure your house. And whatever security you build out, you map it to whatever compliance you need to. Because quite honestly, what you will need from a security standpoint will change faster than legislation can ever change any compliancy. Yeah. And that's that's the harsh reality of this. So 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, first secure your own house, obviously. I, I learned that one the hard way. Um, but secondarily, you know, th there's an ensued liability with any of your clients where they think they're secure because you're servicing them. So unless you've got some sort of baseline uh, security audit that you can show them where their gaps are to establish that transparency and understanding you know, the client's always going to assume you're keeping them secure. Well, let me ask, let me ask you a question here. Cause this is one of my trigger topics and I call it the, the transference of risk fallacy that's found within the MSP community. MSPs love selling themselves as, Hey, we'll become your in-house IT team. So it's just like having your own employees, but we're going to do it for you. Whereas I think the conversation should be, hey, we're an IT company and we're here to help you get to a point of security. We're here to help you get to a point of compliance as it relates to IT. Mm -hmm. Because, And I liken this to attorneys. They will work hard for you, but they make it very clear the risk is yours and only yours. Whatever doesn't matter what happens to you, their life goes on, no problem. And I think mm -hmm. that's the tone and that's the direction we have to take with our clients and say listen we're here to help you if you want to listen to us great if you don't want to listen to us fine but at the end of the day the risk is 100 percent yours not ours and then the only blowback we should be able to have is malpractice you know or some version of that i think yeah put the onus of the responsibility back but here's where the other thing that i've got to fit we got to figure out too is it, and I think there's not going to be any any recourse or any rationalization of this. But, you know, customers, especially in the world that I live in, incident response, they're, they're always like, oh, we thought we had it. We thought we had it. And the IT guy's like, no, I keep telling you, you didn't. You know, so there's always seems to be a disconnect. And, you know, I don't know if it's just a, you know, they're just – you know, they're in shock because they're in an incident that we're having to respond to and they're paying us to. So they're trying to make it look like they're not as bad as of a person as they feel that they are maybe. Or, you know, they're just trying to throw shade on someone else and, you know, just, again, not look as horrible. So it's, it's I don't know, man. I, I always question, you know, we do know that there's a bunch of pizza techs out there. We know that there's a bunch of folks that are just – a shit for a company type of solution. You know, how many of Hey, these stop beating really... up on Kaseya. No, sorry. Um, Brian, your turn. That's good. Um, but there's, a, uh, you know, how many of these companies are actually consulting and how many of them are not, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, always well, where... there's an issue too, where like me at the maturity level I'm at, I'm not even dealing with small businesses anymore, right? Because they they just don't have the budgets, the the understanding of investing into IT, and so I personally kind of feel bad that okay, I'm focusing on these other businesses that actually care, right? Because I have a business to run myself, and I don't want to take on a shared risk with a client that's going to be a pain to work with. But that's where these pizza techs come in, and they swoop up these small clients, and they don't do their due diligence. I mean. Quite honestly, the client wouldn't pay for it anyway. So I feel like there's always going to be this this population of small businesses that are vulnerable and that need a pizza tech. You know, I, I think know. you get what you pay for. And yeah. if that's what you want to pay for, you deserve your incident. I, I have no qualms or pity for them. If you want to pay, you know, $15 for something that should really char be... 65 100 whatever the price is then yeah. you're gonna get what you pay for yep. and you have a family you have employees that you need to take care of and the only way you can do that is by doing business with companies that value what you do and invest in protecting their own people so, yeah mm -hmm. and you know one industry that i think is going to try to escape from any type of security or real compliance is the medical industry I have never seen anything worse than that. It HIPAA is the big to me. It's the biggest joke in terms well, of technology. Let me tell you a short story. My wife went in for a, a non-invasive surgery last month, 
And in the, her recovery room right next door was a COVID patient. And they assured her, oh, we're taking all the proper precautions to not spread COVID, right? And sure enough, what does she do? She brings it home to me. And then we both have COVID all of a sudden because the hospital wasn't even following their own safety guidelines. So do you think they're going to follow HIPAA, you know? Um, it's the wild west, man. Yeah. But there's this illusion that HIPAA is there to help secure the industry. And it's not. People don't really understand it. And most practitioners don't understand it. You know, to give you a personal story, my mom went to a doctor last week and they wanted a copy of her driver's license insurance card. Like, sure, I can send it for you. How do you want me to send it? Blah, blah, blah at gmail.com. Uh -huh. I'm just like, I called up the lady. I'm like, I'm not sending this for you. Why? <laughs> it's not encrypted. You're using free Gmail. Like, no, I'm not doing that. And they got pissy. But I guarantee you there's an IT guy somewhere who set that up for them. Mm -hmm. Or some person who knows a little bit of IT that works inside the organization. You know, I'm actually having... um you know, push back on some, one of my rental, um, the property that I rent from, they have this new, uh, app that they're using to do your own home quarterly home inspections and send it off to them. And I'm like, hold on. I'm literally taking probably around a hundred, 150 pictures of my home that's being used and oh, sending so it off to exactly your, you, you know, if that thing gets breached, the treasure trove of information of a layout of a house is massive. Now, granted, is someone really going to try to break into my freaking house? I doubt it. Someone would rather just hit Dude, me over you the keep head doing time. these podcasts and poking at Prometheus. Yeah, they're going to break into your shit. And you just told them how to get a copy of all your pictures of your house. That's right, man. <laughs> you know, you bring up an interesting topic that is OSINT. Are you guys doing anything to help your clients reduce that risk in terms of their IT and OSINT? Yeah, so right now we're doing the web scans, you know, cloud instances. You know, if you got, um, you know, Dropbox, if you got uh, Azure, Azure, AWS, you know, all these different platforms, you know, do they have open containers, things of that nature? Um you know, we're constantly, at least once a month, we'll check out their listing on Google. We had uh, one not too long ago where it, and it took about three months to freaking fix it. But, you know, you can always share pictures of a business that you went to. Well, this was a, a completely online. No, no customers ever go to this freaking manufacturing company. But for some reason, one of the customers home addresses shipping FedEx shipping label was on their Google results. And I'm like, how in Sam hell did that happen? And it literally took, took us about three months to get that freaking removed. And I was like, this is not good. And granted, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's not that bad, but still it's, it's a path. I don't like to start any path, you know, cut it off. Let's get rid of that gold, uh, yellow brick road. They start putting up a wall you know, I, I don't want any of those things going on. So it's um, you've got to do it because most of your clients are not going to. And, you know, Shodan is not the end all be all by any means. You know, we've actually got the book that I leverage pretty he heavily. You know, um, I'll even put a link down in the description for those. But this is a massive book just around OSINT. And at least two of my classes every year is pure OSINT learning. What's the newest things? How can you improve, improve your Google foo? And well, um, dude, I that think stuff. that, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but the weakest link is always the human element. Mm -hmm. Computers yeah. don't program themselves yet. So we are the weakest link. Yeah. Goodbye. Good. Now, <laughs> what are you guys doing in terms of, in, uh, this is a two part question for you for both. What are you doing in terms of incident response planning or lack thereof like Colonial? And also, what are you doing in terms of insider threat protection? Brian? So 
I mean, on the incident response, it's a work in progress for us with our clients because it really is, unfortunately, kind of a two way you know, street when it comes to that. It's not just everything's on IT when an incident happens, you know, especially if there's certain things that need to be happening in a timely manner. So we're, uh, you have a hand raised? Yes, I do, sir. Yes. If you silo IT in your contracts for your incident response plans and your baseline of your clients, you can platform that and make it a very easy workflow. And offline, I'd be happy to share with you with what I'm doing. And you get them to a certain type of playbook where yep. it works across all of your clients and you don't need any input from them other than who's going to be in charge of X, Y, Z. Contacts, yep. Yeah, that's so, it. So, so that's, that's one battle, right, that we see. The other battle is, okay, when an incident happens, how do we automate it as much as possible to hold everyone accountable that's supposed to be taking care of the things that they're assigned to take care of? And, and so... We're, we're maybe I'm putting the cart before the horse concerned about that automation, but we're looking at um, cloud Oak channel to potentially help with that. I, I still dig it into their product to see, you know, to vet them essentially, but, but you're, you know, you're right. It's, it's really having that plan developed ahead of time on how you want to handle things and then determining the contacts from the client side that need to be involved. But I feel like there's almost a little kind of upfront training that should be handled for, with these contacts so they understand how important their role is, right? I think one thing there, and this kind of goes into backup disaster recovery and business continuity. When I sell business continuity, I specifically say it's business IT continuity. Yeah. Because that's all I, that's, that's my little three foot circle of life, right? Yeah. It's not there. It's not anything else. It's not their water delivery. It's not their utilities. It's their IT services. And I think when we're doing incident response planning, we really have to make it clear contractually and verbally that that's all we're doing. If you want us to sit in on other meetings for other parts of your IRPs, that's fine. You know, whether it's an add on charge or not, you know, that's between you and the client. But you really need to draw that line in the sand and say it's IT only. And corporate owned IT. Yeah. I thought, uh, well, I mean, you're right because I mean, you could even consider like an active shooter an incident, and how do they respond to that? And is that how related to that is IT? Do not use your lap laptop as a shield. <laughs> use a desk. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could say lock your computer before you run out the door or hide, but what's the chance an active shooter is coming in to try to hack on your network? You know, you know, <laughs> you know, taking that example, applying it to January 6th, when people went into the Capitol and you saw computers that were still logged in. I think that's a simple GPO or Intune policy saying, Hey, five, 10 minutes of inactivity, lock yourself, yeah. which not many providers actually set up. Yeah. And I, I don't get that, but you know, that's an, inc that's an incident response or part of an incident response plan. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. that's I think the low hanging fruit there. But what uh, what are you doing about insider threat protection? So, you know, we've actually had some um, conversations with a, one of our largest co managed clients about this. Their their insider threat concern is mainly around disgruntled employees because they have so much turnover. So, um, really, you know, least privilege is a huge one. Um, having a, a proper offboarding um, plan developed ahead of time where you can immediately cut someone off of resources. If there's any suspicious concern for suspicious activity, the, the ability to, um, you know, monitor closely activity of that particular user to identify whether or not they're doing things they shouldn't be. So we, we've got, it's not, we don't have a perfect solution. It's kind of, you know, we're dependent on our clients to let us know if they're concerned about a disgruntled employee. And then we, we essentially put a magnifying glass on them until they're potentially let go. And then we make sure the minute that they're let go, we have a way to lock down everything, right? Are you doing SSO or trying to leverage SSO to have that one identity that shuts everything down? 100%, yep. And what about DLP? Is that playing a role for you? So, yeah, we've got, 
obviously DLP built into the M365 stack that we make use of. Um, we've also, and I'm, I'm curious to see, you know, there's this company called BitDam that Datobot that we're using and I love because it's kind of, you know, ATP security for things other than email, right? I mean, we're, yeah. we're using email less and less and less. We're using Teams and Zoom and, you know, all of these file sync and share services, right? And so what's monitoring those, you know, re resources and then how they're being used, you know, and, and what's, what's passing in and out of them? You know, it's not just going through email now. So that that's kind of a vector I see where, you know, yeah, you know, potential data, data exfiltration could happen through maybe someone sets up a Dropbox account, a personal Dropbox account, right? And, and so, you know, our RMM products can see all of the software that's installed and we've got things like, you know, a Windows application control where we can allow and disallow local applications to run. But short of using DNS filter and blocking certain sites, which is kind of a, a, a binary way to do it, um, you, you don't really have control over what they're using in the web. So we're actually, we just started using a company that's going to help us identify. They're basically taking DNS filter logs and identifying what cloud apps are being used from what users. What and product is that, if you don't uh, mind saying? Augment is the one we're currently using. Okay. Yeah. What about cloud app security in 365? Yeah, we, we require that as, as our baseline um, uh, security as, as part of the licensing. So we do an add-on if they've only got the 365 business premium. And, and that obviously is where you can do some enforcement, you know, deny, approve. Um, but first you have to know what's in the wild to know what to deny or, or approve, right? Is Simeon Cloud doing anything in that part of uh, 365 for you? Not on their baseline, no. Um, they, they, well, they, they have a they have a policy they put in that you can tweak, but there's nothing out of the box where they're automatically blocking certain things for okay. obvious reasons, right? Yeah. So you I mean, have there to should, there, there should be at least an audit mode that flags, right? I mean, yeah. that would yeah. be nice. I'll, I'll have to double check and look into that. Um, the problem, the reason we went the augment route is because we've only got about probably 70% of our clients on Microsoft right now. And some are still using G Suite that we're getting moved over or, mm -hmm. or they're on um, our old partner. We used to use AppRiver before, you know, Office 365 was a thing. We were using hosted exchange through AppRiver. So um, we needed a, pro a, a, a product we could use across all of our clients, you know, for this initial need. But yeah, I... I'm finding that more and more of these third-party tools that we're using now are eventually going to come baked into Microsoft, and it's like, why, you know, duplicate efforts? You know, I think so. the The only product I really leverage outside of 365 is probably CrowdStrike. If I could do real multi-tenancy management of AT, uh, Defender ATP for Endpoint or whatever the name of the day is that I'd give it a serious consideration. But also I quite enjoy having the CrowdStrike Overwatch SOC looking over the endpoints. Well, and, and I'm sure SOCs are going to integrate with Defender ATP if they haven't already, you know. What so. are you using for your endpoint protection? Uh, Sophos. Okay. We had Silence. We went from Silence to Sophos. And uh, I have no problem going to Defender ATP down the road if I can make it efficient enough for my team to manage. Um, the the one I like about Sophos is we're also using their UTMs. So you get the endpoint to UTM communication, right? Do you really need that though? That's a good, great question. You know, I maybe mean, does it actually work? Yeah. Because uh, you've got isolation built into Hitman Pro, which is Intercept or whatever they call it now. You have isolation built into the standard NGAV agent, you have isolation built into the Wi-Fi. I, I see it more as, you know, obviously the isolation, you're right. Maybe there's other ways to do that, but it is nice to kind of have centralized reporting, especially for incidents where you can pull, you know, information from the firewall and the endpoint and kind of correlate all that together, right? Are they actually doing that? Because I was using Sophos MTR for a little while. 
and it was a horrible, it was a hot mess. So I, I do not use their MTR product or their EDR. Okay. Oh, that's so your black point side. Yeah. We're just intercept X advanced is what we use. Gotcha. What about you, Arik? What are you doing for AV? Uh, right now we're doing Bitdefender EDR, but we are in a proof of concept with CrowdStrike. I really like CrowdStrike. It's a yeah. fantastic product. You know, when you, when you start looking at stuff, it's like, okay, um, and what are the big boys using? What what are the like in MySpace? What are the other incident response companies? They're using, using Barricade Cyber. What else is there? Come on. That's right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's other companies that are using a lot of different things from um, CrowdStrike. So we're we're going down that path to at least help us advance our incident response. Um, we're going to be looking at a uh, Red Canary for some of that stuff as well. So I've, I've got a question when it comes to, to socks, right? There is good. Are we, the, are we talking about security operations centers here or yeah. what I put over my crusty feet? <laughs> not, not the not left or the right sock, the security operations center. I mean, they're only as good as the information they have access to, right? That they can see on your network, right? I fundamentally disagree there. And I'll tell you why after though. Okay. So my, so, you know, one of the, the reasons that I, I, I liked black point cyber mainly because they take a different approach than most socks. I find most socks rely on a SIM to understand what's going on on the network. And then when you look into the complexities of how does that information even get to the SIM and then how much information is in the SIM, and then you're basically spending most of your time building and perfecting the mousetrap so that you can then identify suspicious behavior because there's too much information to be able to do that manually versus looking at actual real life playbooks and like here's how threat actors are here's what they're doing in your network now and focusing on identifying that activity versus a bloated sim with a bunch of information where you're constantly trying to build a mousetrap to identify it i don't disagree with you there with your and to me, it sounds like you're describing what Blackpoint is doing, which is why I like them. Yeah. There are managed sims in the channel, or managed socks, whatever you want to call them these days, who talk a big game, but their product is absolute garbage. And I'm not going to call anybody out here. Um, but I know of companies who were using these managed socks, and these are end client customers, not the MSPs using that managed sock. They had the best antivirus on there. They had the best monitoring solutions like Tenable, FireEyes, and everything else. And this sock didn't integrate with everything, but the ones they said they integrated with completely missed incidents even after they happened. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of Kool-Aid out there in terms of managed sock, SIM, or whatever the term is. And... If anyone is using any of these things, you should get someone to pen test. Not pen test, but you should get someone to do some kind of test to set off the alarms and see what they do. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely different than testing an antivirus because typically those are tested in, in vacuums. But, you know, so you, you have access typically that the average threat actor may not have access to initially, or that if they did get that access, you'd, you'd be having alerts fired off, letting you know, hey, they're this far into your network, right? Or not, because I use that managed sock, and Eric loves this story. Yeah. Eric was banging on the door for maybe an hour or two, never got alerted. And he was doing the obvious stuff, right? And this managed sock never said anything. And when I brought it up to them and I showed them the logs, they couldn't say anything. The logs were there, but their their bodies, their algorithm didn't flag anything. Well, it sounds like their, their mousetrap wasn't all the way built yet. <laughs> I think they run their trap quite a lot. And I don't think they have a real mousetrap. But again, you know, if someone's being as brazen as Eric was about it with my full permission and knowledge, then they should have caught it. And that's endemic in the channel and it sucks that I've seen so far. And yeah. to be fair, I was, I was going a little 
you know, a little stealthy, if you will, at first, you know, just being, you know, I'll poke here, I'll poke here, poke here. And then when he didn't get any of that stuff, I was like, all right, let's get really noisy and see if they notice this. And they still didn't. And she was just like, um, I don't know what to say about this. What, what about a, a sock that you go to that says they support a security product, but then you come to find out that the integration with their SIM or the SIM, however they're monitoring that, uses a clunky API that only sends information every 15 minutes. Like, I mean, you know, aren't you at the mercy of, hey, you know, they've got a 15 minute window to do a bunch of stuff before my sock's even going to know about it, right? Take that. Add on the fact that if you're using an elastic stack for a managed situation, your cron jobs can only run every five or 10 minutes because you're going to have too much latency that affects everyone else. So now take that 15 minute API delay and a five to 10 minute cron job delay. Yeah. What are you at? 20, 25 minutes? Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, I like my new approach, and Eric, correct me if I'm wrong here, is that get a really good EDR onto your device. Let that sock use that EDR. Not unlike Blackpoint. I know we keep saying their name over and over, but it's a good product. People are smart. And let them do that threat hunting based on the EDR data and the noise that's going on on the physical network. And then use a managed sock or whatever the hell you want to call it to do your SaaS applications. Because... Yeah. Most of the, first of all, it's up to a 24-hour delay to get logs out of 365. So you and I both know something can happen within five minutes. And one of the things I mentioned to John was, forget all these events, forget all these logins. Why is no one auditing and tracking what these enterprise applications are doing with PowerShell in the cloud? Mm -hmm. Because you have Azure Automations, you can have a OAuth app or some kind of app that can blast off PowerShell. Because at the end of the day, PowerShell is the back end of this thing, right? So why are we not auditing that? Yeah. It's, it's I mean, uh, Eric will tell you it's happening now, threat vectors via API, but as we tighten up our identity security uh, and there's less low-hanging fruit, you know, with user credentials, I could see that being the next Wild West is, API integrations and, you know, are they set up with least privileges and how much access do they do? And are you monitoring what they are doing? Um, for sure. I, I mean, I'm pushing data right now to support, um, you know, the, their products ex, uh, sending logs to a SIM just so I could have that be understand all the activity that's happening, especially with their RMM product. Are they actually going to do it? I've, I'm told that they're working on it. I haven't been, I haven't had any meetings with them yet to go over, you know, the features or what it's going to do. But most recently I mentioned, hey, don't just focus on user accounts. I also want to see activity with APIs as well. You know, one of the things I don't like about Datto RMM is that the API is tied to, to your user or someone else's user. You can't just create a specific API user. Yeah, it, 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 you have to create a use. I mean, you don't, you shouldn't tie it to an actual user, but you create a dedicated user account, right, for that right. API. And yeah, versus just creating a key. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I'd rather have that key pair. Yeah. I think that key pair would be the user. But what yeah. do I mean? I'm just an IT guy, man. You get no respect. <laughs> Well, hey, at, since COVID, we're now essential workers, though, at least. We're considered an essential essential industry, finally. Yeah, we might be essential workers, but people still look at us as a cost center and not a value proposition. No. And I think there's a direct correlation to that and the number of pizza techs out there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, here's the position we take with our clients, our, both our existing and new leads, is we understand no, you know, not everyone can afford you know, the best security overnight. But we want to know that our clients are willing to get there, right? So we establish our baseline audit to understand the gaps. We create a technology roadmap prioritized by, you know, here's the things we should do first, here's the things we should do last. And then we literally want schedule that out with the client. 
and then hold them accountable to that to the point where if, if they don't follow that roadmap that we both originally agreed to, there's discussions of, hey, we're going to eventually have to part ways because, you know, you're, you're not going to you're too much of a shared risk for us right now. Speaking of onboarding, what's your typical time frame for onboarding? And Eric, if you're around, I'm curious what yours is, too. Uh, hit and miss, depending on the client. Uh, um, you know, if if a client's already, for the most part, out in the cloud, it's very fairly streamlined, easy to do. Um, if they've got a bunch of old, antiquated technology, um, we tend to spend a lot more time under, understanding why the hell they have things set up the way they do to, to get that initial audit. Um, and I don't consider onboarding done until we've done our audit. I mean, obviously, there's the onboarding of, hey, install all your software, you know, and, and we've, we're using autopilot in our RMM to help automate most of that. Um, uh, Obviously, a new client would probably won't have autopilot out of the gate, but you know the RMM is what comes in and helps us there. No, I definitely agree. For us, we do an onboarding probably within a week, uh, four days, five days. But well, I take a more client side, it's, it's going to be a factor too. I would imagine, right? Marginal, because if you're really building your onboarding around GPOs or Intune once they hit either or they'll be done i think that work let me rephrase this the work to get the environment up to scratch takes about four or five days because we're going to rip and replace the entire network minus cabling uh so we're talking firewalls waps yeah. switches and then we will completely redo the gpo which is real if we're dealing with gpos we're, that's probably a two-day proposition by itself if we're dealing with Intune, that's probably two days in of itself as well. And I think once you get those two and you get the endpoints connected to whether it's Intune or the local AD, a lot of it kind of takes care of itself. And then for me, the RMM really deploys the antivirus and you're off to the races. Yeah. So so we work a little differently in the sense that if, if we take on a client that doesn't have Microsoft 365 yet, we don't necessarily set all that up before we onboard them. We'll onboard them first, as is, get a lay of the land, then propose here's the projects we need to do. And then, and then so that's kind of secondarily. And then we also you know, don't necessarily rip and replace all the network gear, although if it needs to be rip and replaced, again, that's a project. Um, and then it gets a little trickier too now that we're in the co-managed um, vertical. The pissing where, contest. <laughs> yeah, where you, where you can't necessarily go in and rip and replace a lot of stuff, right? And and that's a vertical we're getting into by high demand of internal IT departments wanting MSP tools that they can't buy direct. And I'm literally getting leads from vendors selling thousands of licenses of these tools we use just starting off the relationship like that i can i can be as hands off or as hands on as, as yeah. you want me to be but let's start out with this licensing and then see where the relationship grows from there so we're getting a little dynamic in how we service our clients but at any rate even with the co-managed clients we make them aware of their security gaps right and, and we want them to, we want to help them down that journey even if we're not going to be doing a fair amount of the work you know i think for me at least for my company if you're going to be a managed services customer, we take a very heavy handed approach. Like it's, it's a very narrow parameters and yep. this is how it is. If you want to deviate out of that, you have two options. You can be a VAR client of ours where, you know, we resell you what we need and then you buy time and material and we'll do that. I have no problem with that. Or you just go find somebody else. But if you want my managed services, you have to walk that narrow line. Yep. Because now, now, what if there's so much work to do that you can't get it done in your four to five day, right? I mean, you've got to phase things out because you can't do too much at once, right? No, we're the conversation I have with leadership, especially with larger companies, is you're going to have, and you know, four days could stretch out to two weeks because, yes, if you're a 2000 shop 
operation, it's going to take more time, right? But for the most part, when you're dealing with a five to 200 user environment, yeah. your GPOs aren't going to be too crazy. You can, you, yeah. if you have good people, you could probably get it done in a handful of days and you have multiple people doing different things at the same time. Yeah. But it really depends on how much pain they're willing to endure for that small amount of time to just really be able to use technology for what it was intended to. And that's the conversation I have with them. It's like, yeah. I can change the way you use technology in your business and then you will be able to leverage it, but it will be painful. You will hate me. You will curse me for signing that contract. But I promise you in a week or two, you're going to forget about me except when you got to send that check. No, I, I actually like that approach. I'm going to consider using that. I mean, it's kind of the rip, ripping the Band-Aid off approach, right? Yeah. It's like we can make this slowly painful for you or we can just rip the Band-Aid off and get it all done. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I had this one client we onboarded. They were using public IPs internally. Nothing routed properly. And it was co-managed. The CTO or CI, whatever the tech exec was, okay, we need to phase it across these 10 sites. We can't, I said, no, we're doing it all on the same day. You got two choices. We can do it after hours or we can do it first thing in the morning. And he was like, no, 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 we can't. I'm like, no, we're going to do it. Went, went above them, went to their uh, uh, manager or whoever. He approved it. We rolled it out. I mean, the biggest problem there was just remapping the uh, printers because they didn't do it with GPO. They had individual printers installed. 300 users, but again, rip that bandaid off, call it a day. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can see taking that approach with some of our clients. This last one we did was a nonprofit and oh my God, about half their staff is afraid of technology and change. The other half kind of embraces it. And, and that dealing with that half of users that are, are getting fumbled up because they don't have a desktop icon, right. To get to what they need to get to, you know, and they freak out and everything stops. How you know? did, uh, how did that windows update that temperature on the taskbar help you <laughs> that piss off anybody? <laughs> we haven't, uh, I haven't had that come across my radar yet, but, um, I'll have to ask the team about that in our meeting tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Eric, you around? I guess not. Anything else you wanted to go over? I mean, we, we, we were talking about the, the vulnerability management, you know, which I think is, is definitely something I feel like we're still perfecting. So um, I really want to find a company that makes it easy for us. Um, where we don't have to digest so much information to understand what we need to make happen, you know? Have you looked at Tenable? I, I, I already had them on my list, but I'm going to look at them again. The other one that I got um, from actually the CISO at Data was Kenna Security, but I imagine they're more enterprise and probably costly. Uh, Tenable is not bad. It's a pretty good product, uh, well-priced, but, you know, you get what you pay for. It's yeah. probably more expensive than cyber CNS. I would give them a look if you want. I can make an intro to uh, my rep over there. And also I talked to John or whoever your contact is at Blackpoint because I think yeah. vulnerability scanning with where they're going with logic is a yeah. natural fit. And if you can get it all in one house, and I hate to say this term because it's not really, but it's their problem, then I prefer that, at least for me. Yeah, I mean, they they live and breathe security, you know, a lot more than I do, you know, so it's nice to have the right eyes on, on the right data. I'm actually onboarding with Logic this week with them. Okay. That's, that's what I'm going to be trying out as my, my, my SIM solution. Um, I'm trying to avoid Azure Sentinel for now um, and seeing if this might work out with Blackpoint, but if it doesn't, I have a feeling I might end up having to deal with, you know, Sentinel. You know what I like about Logic from Blackpoint is that fixed cost, whereas Sentinel is a variable cost. Yeah. And 365 can get very noisy, believe it or not. Uh, my tenant 
cost me a couple hundred bucks in workspace log fees every month to ship it over to the sim I use. So, yeah. but, and uh, Blackpoint, they're building their own 365. Yep. That so, that, you know, th he's got a really nice ecosystem that he's building there that snaps in pretty well for the MSP world. Yep. So, all righty. Anything else you wanted to go over? No, I guess we lost Eric, huh? He got bored of us. No, so, he, he just messaged. He said he's on, on the line. Uh, the guy needs to be cloned, man. He's got yes. so much IR business coming in that no. he's got to clone himself. So, but Anyway, thank you for joining us, Brian. Had a, had a blast. Hope to have you on again. And uh, everyone, please like, subscribe. Find us wherever you can, amplified and intensified.com. Brian Weiss is itechsolutions.com. Brian, do you want to tell people how to uh, get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, it's uh, brian.weiss at itech-solutions.com. Feel free to email me. You can also find me on LinkedIn and, and Facebook, although I might block you if you get too political with me. <laughs> Which side do you lean? I'm you don't have to answer that. I'm just messing with you. Uh, <laughs> you can answer if you want. I don't I, care. I, I don't care. I'm, I'm definitely more conservative, um, but, you know, uh, towards the middle, you know, I, I like to listen to both sides. I feel like we need both sides. You can't be all conservative or, you know. You mean we're not always right all the time? No, there needs to be a balance. People are allowed to have different opinions. You got to well, bring everyone's opinions to the know, table. And to me, to that's, that's the American way, right? You yeah. get to do you, I get to do me and... We get both get to be as crazy as we want to be. So, all righty. So, thank you all again. See, you. Eric, you want to?